Yes, thanks to the organisers. For a guy who spent 10 years working on dual purpose crops, um, I'm, I'm now going to deal with the issue of continuous cropping. Um, and uh, just like to acknowledge the list of um, people who contributed to this, uh, and also there's a list of consultants. And thank you to Barry Mudge if he's here as well. Um, so uh, the GRDC wanted my take home messages up front, so I've, I've put them here. It serves as a bit of a um, summary of the talk uh, as I'll go through it. So um, I think uh, in the right circumstances, continuous cropping can be sustained, but it's going to take careful management, and we'll talk through that. I think the key challenges I've listed there, which I'll work through in my talk, are understanding and focusing on the nutrient balance and the issue of fertility decline, um, managing weeds, of course, and, and towards the end, a little bit more about uh, economic risks um, in continuous cropping. And I think underpinning the solution to all of those things is maintaining a suitable diversity of crops, end use portfolios for those crops, and having a flexible approach uh, to, to practices. So by way of background, um, we know that uh, cropping systems have been intensifying in Australia over the last few years. Essentially, we've got fewer farms, larger farms, more crop, which is largely at the expense of, of pasture area, some fallow, but largely pasture area. With that has come more diversity. You can see there as cropping area has increased, um, so too has the diversity. Jumps around a little, but it's, it's, it's on the increase. We've adopted no-till uh, and stubble retention farming systems. And I guess another thing to be mindful of is, the, is the, um, uh, that one person now is managing a lot more land than they used to. So that, uh, that creates its own issues in terms of being able to manage uh, farming systems uh, effectively. So John's um, given a good background to some of the future opportunities that are coming in, in technology, uh, and, and I guess opportunities, I would say, abound. We've got exploitable yield gaps in most of our crops. Um, we know we've got improved varieties, uh, particularly in some of those alternative crops, the pulses and so forth. Over the last few years, we've been able to demonstrate um, uh, big gains to be made by getting the right agronomy packages together, the, the summer fallow management and earlier sowing and so forth. Um, John mentions V's paper that indicates that we have had a, you know, a real um, climate issue in trying to maintain our yields over the last um, 20 or so years, but we've done so in spite of a 27% decline in, in what the climate was offering us. We've been able to maintain those yields pretty steady, which means that underpinning the climate shift has been an incredible and actually unprecedented improvement in the adoption of new technologies. Um, and also, uh, on an economic level, um, recent ABARES data shows that the top 25% of, of, of grain specialists um, are making double the return on their capital as the rest. So obviously there's, there's opportunities and there's room for improvement. Um, Australia developed a mixed farming system for good reason. It was mostly around the fact that we do have a variable climate, we have variable prices, we're not highly subsidised, and that most farms will have land on, on it which is not arable, so sometimes that drives us to a mixed system. A few years ago, um, with a number of colleagues, um, we looked into the trend of, of cropping intensification and where it was going to end and, and, and what was driving it. And I think I don't want this talk to descend into a mixed farming versus continuous cropping um, argument, um, because basically, the consultants we worked with on that concluded that essentially um, farm business profits varied less with the percentage of the farm that you cropped and more with management skill. So it's not what you do, it's how well you do it that was really driving things. So um, I don't want to get too much into that. I want to focus on continuous cropping, either part of your farm or all of your farm, if that's what you've chosen to do. And to ask the question, given current technologies and foreseeable technologies and best bet management, as we now know it, what are the issues that are likely to, to threaten the capacity to have ongoing, profitable, um, continuous cropping systems? So um, John mentioned this study of, of um, SVs, and I think I just want to I want to just deal with this and then put it to one side. Um, we have had this climate trend over the last 20 years or so. Um, it's essentially increasing temperature, driving more rapid crop development, limiting grain number and yield potential. Um, drier, of course, uh, and also more extreme events, frosts and, and other things, and having to manage around those. The improvement in carbon uh, really only offset this by, by 4%, so it would otherwise be 31% had we not had a bit of uh, fertilisation from increased CO2. 
Now, as John said, um, this has not been reflected in the actual yields because you guys have been doing a very good job in, in, in developing and adopting new technology. So that's the good news. I think hidden within that paper is also some more challenging news, and that is the people who predict how these climate changes are going to affect our yields, um, according to Svee's data, have actually underpredicted um, the impact on yields. So they may be um, uh, more significant than we thought. So these climate trends are going to be an important thing to keep in mind uh, as we go along. So um, I listed the challenges, and the first one was soil fertility. So um, let's look at that first. Um, Australia uh, has done a great job, uh, in fact, lead the world in the adoption of no-till uh, stubble-retained farming systems. There's a graph there put together by Rick. Um, we're up now at very high levels. And so um, as pastures have given way to more crops, with the adoption of no-till farming systems and stubble retention, um, that's gone a long way to protect the soil from erosion, to, to maintain structural stability. But I guess I question whether we have maintained a focus on the capacity to, to um, keep stable organic matter uh, in the soil. Now, the reason I say that is because pastures are known to be able to build soil carbon. There's a number of reasons for that. There's something growing all year round. You don't remove a lot of carbon with a grazing system. Uh, there's generally a legume phase. And so traditionally, we have had a system of building fertility during the pasture phase, utilising it during the cropping phase. Now, there's a lot of long-term studies now, both in Australia and over overseas, that show that depending on your starting point, no-till farming, continuous no-till cropping, can maintain um, organic matter, but it doesn't often build it. And in some cases, it continues to decline slowly. Here's some data from a long-term trial at Wagga with a loop and wheat um, continuous cropping system over about 20 years. It's, it's typical of other data sets, showing that um, if you're burning and cultivating, of course, you're losing a lot of carbon. Um, but even the system with full stubble retention and direct drilling in a, in a, in a loop and wheat rotation, there was a small, although non-significant, but a small loss of carbon. So we weren't building soil carbon in that system. We were slowly um, losing it. So the question is why? Why, if we're retaining all our crop residues and we would appear to be keeping all the carbon there, why is it so difficult in these systems? And um, my colleague, Clive Kirkby, um, asked that question when he was visiting our long-term site at Harden, and, and I think has sort of hit upon um, one of the answers, at least. So we talk about soil carbon, but we should be talking about organic matter. You don't find carbon in soil, you find organic matter. And organic matter, the stable organic matter, or humus, contains pretty um, constant amounts of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So they all, they all go together. That's why it pro provides fertility, because it's got these nutrients in it which mineralize and become available to crops. So if you want to rebuild carbon, it's important to know that often you may have enough carbon in the form of a lot of crop residue going into the soil, but if you don't have sufficient of these, um, it could be the nutrients that are limiting the capacity to maintain or build soil carbon. So Clive did his PhD on this question and um, ultimately tested the idea at our long-term field site at Harden. So we had a treatment here where we'd been incorporating all of the residue every year for, for, for 20 years when Clive started. Um, so he took over that treatment and he simply put a couple of um, different treatments in place. We continued to incorporate the stubble as we had always done. Um, nine tonnes of wheat residue every, every year, wheat or canola. And he either added or didn't add supplementary nutrients, just nitrogen, phosphorus and sulphur as granular starter fertiliser, according to these ratios, to see if he could um, maintain more soil carbon. So the, the amount of carbon going in here is identical. No difference in the amount of carbon. It's just the nutrients for the difference. Over six years, from 2006 to 2012, we lost 3.2 tonnes of carbon where we didn't add the nutrients. We gained 5.5 tonnes of carbon where we were adding the nutrients. So that's a difference of, sorry, that's a difference of, um, you know, a difference of about 8 tonnes, 8.7 tonnes of carbon, simply by um, adding nutrients. Now, I'm not suggesting people, this is, not, this is not to sort of uh, suggest you incorporate stubble or add a lot of nutrients. It, it's simply to, to um, explain why often it may be difficult, despite the fact that we're retaining a lot of crop residue, that we might, what we're still losing stable organic matter. Because if you, if you put a lot of carbon into the soil, 
and the microorganisms um, are trying to deal with that carbon and they don't have these nutrients available, they actually break down your existing carbon to get the nutrients out to deal with the new carbon. And this, this is why it a, 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 tends to not increase. So if humus is the source of mineralized nitrogen, um, so, so let's think about humus as the supply now of nitrogen and nitrogen fertility. We know that this organic nitrogen uh, will decline at about two to three cent percent per year. Um, so you can see, you know, total carbon here is declining. This is the humus part also declining. Uh, the particular organic matter, the plant material, declines quite quickly under cultivation, but here's the humus de declining slowly. The nitrogen um, is declining with it uh, because it's the source of um, the organic matter, the humus is the source of that nitrogen. So many studies have shown this long-term decline under cultivation. Um, and so if there isn't a pasture phase, if you're continuously cropping without a pasture phase, um, then your options to try to um, arrest this decline or maintain a better total nitrogen status is obviously to either replace that with fertiliser nitrogen. This is a graph from a recent paper of John Angus sort of showing nationally for Australia the amount of nitrogen offtake um, and here's the sort of fertiliser um, supply. So you see for a long time we were really mining the, uh, you know, the, the indigenous soil nitrogen. Um, and the other option, of course, is to, is to incorporate legumes into the system. Um, just, to, uh, just to compare this for a little while, this, have, this is some data from a recent study compiled by Mark Peoples from the, from the Break Crop Initiative, the GRDC-funded initiative, just showing you the sorts of amounts of nitrogen that can be fixed by legumes. So, so it's, it's linked to the biomass produced by the legume, assuming the legume is, is nodulated and fixing nitrogen. And so you can see in terms of how much they fix, pulses can actually uh, fix, you know, on average, amounts similar to, to good pastures in a year, but all of them are extremely variable. And I think there's a paper later on in the session um, about um, things that influence this with pulses. So this is the total amount fixed, but of course the amount of nitrogen left in the system, you have to take away what's removed, and of course the pulses are removing a lot of nitrogen in the grain if they're harvested for grain. Brown manures, of course, it mostly will stay in the system um, and they're matching, uh, on, in this data set, uh, pastures. But you can see all of them across even this one data set, extremely variable from very, not very much nitrogen to quite significant amounts of nitrogen. So um, if you're going to have a legume in the system, you've got to have it working hard for you to, to help you to maintain that nitrogen balance. And so if you, if you uh, are in most systems running down this organic nitrogen source um, and it's not being replaced, then over time, of course, the amount of, if, if in this case, this is for a red soil in southern New South Wales, assuming four tonne wheat crops at about 10.5% protein, you can sort of work out that as this declines and as the na natural source of nitrogen diminishes and you have to replace more from fertiliser, that the, that the, the amount um, you can expect to get from the soil declines, fertiliser uh, need goes up, and so the cost of that fertiliser becomes the issue of whether that is sustainable at um, current or potentially future high fertiliser prices. And if you're on a different soil in a lower rainfall zone um, and even operating at slightly lower wheat uh, yields, of course, um, all the numbers are a little smaller, but at the end of the day, uh, in terms of the, the end cost to your sort of gross margin bottom line, it's still the same story. So the question is, what's your strategy to maintain this, this nitrogen fertility um, or to be able to afford this increasing fertiliser nitrogen bill? Um, and I guess there's, there's, there's two strategies. One is to become more efficient with your fertiliser nitrogen. And there are whole projects within GRDC and experts on this. I won't, I won't try to cover all of the issues there. Again, John's paper suggests that typical losses of nitrogen um, are about 22% for, for wheat production in Australia in his recent review. So obviously that's a, if you can arrest that direct loss, that's being lost out of the system. Um, the crop's only getting on average about 44%, often it's, often it's less than that. Uh, this soil level, of course, the nitrogen that goes into the soil is assisting to build the microorganisms in the humus, so if it stays in the soil, it should, it should become available to you, unless, of course, it, it drifts into this loss. So your aim is to reduce these losses and within, within the, the nitrogen that you have to try and match, better match the supply with demand. And um, there are numerous technologies that assist with this and, uh, and other people will be talking about these throughout the, 
throughout the meeting. Um, my message is just, I guess, to realise that if you are defining nitrogen use efficiency of your crop as the kilograms of grain for the kilograms of nitrogen supplied, remember that a very efficient crop may just be mining the soil nitrogen and to be aware of where you are on that, on that curve and, and where your farm and your system is heading um, in, that, in, that, in that context. Um, here's an example of a, of a nitrogen budget that um, Therese Macbeth has done with, with Rick and others at Karunda on their long-term site. This is for a five-year um, continuous cereal phase and just to sort of show you an example of a, an area where it's typical to put on about nine to 20 kilos of N per hectare per year. This just shows with um, different nitrogen strategies what the nitrogen balance looks like, so the total nitrogen balance in kilograms per hectare on the different soils, the different variable soils across that system. And so you can see um, if 9 to 20 is the average, then mostly on all of those soils you're in a general, you're running down the nitrogen, um, uh, you're in negative balance. And even with some you know, higher levels of nitrogen here, some of the soils are still, um, still losing a little and others are in surplus there. So to be aware of your soil and your system and where you are in that context um, is important to know uh, in terms of, of managing nitrogen because it, it, it is a big cost uh, to the system. So fertiliser nitrogen, uh, managing that more efficiently. The other, of course, is to get legumes into your system. And um, I guess uh, down here in South Australia, um, thank you to, to Lan for this, for this data. Uh, the lentil area, if you're in an area where you can grow a highly profitable, um, uh, reliable uh, legume and have that in your system quite frequently, um, then that's a plus. Of course, remember, as I said before, if you're, if you're harvesting these um, uh, the legumes for grain, you're still removing quite a bit from the system. So um, uh, it helps to offset the loss, but, but be, aware, be aware of how much you're losing. The other, th the other option, of course, is to use the legumes in the system in, with more diverse end uses as hay, um, uh, brown manure, uh, and, and these may be a, um, a better option in lower rainfall, more risky um, areas, or where there could be some multiple uh, purposes for these crops in the system. So I just want to show some examples of that. Um, this is from some, some work, some recent work um, in southern New South Wales with, with FarmLink. And in that area, we have a pretty intensive canola wheat uh, system. Um, and uh, in this case, we were looking at whether it was possible to, to um, introduce one of these diverse uses. In this case, it was vetch for hay. So we compare, we're comparing here um, in a phased rotation over the last four years, um, vetch for hay followed by canola wheat and barley um, compared to you know, a higher input canola wheat wheat system. And just to sort of summarise um, that, that rotation, we've been able to reduce the total end costs. Um, most of the, the costs that we reduced, as you can see, related to being able to reduce the end costs and still um, make as good a profit on this system as with this system. Now that was surprising, I guess, for a lot of people in that area where we sort of traditionally think that the grain legumes are not terribly profitable. Um, but here we were able to utilise that in a system, um, reduce some risk and maintain our profit. So now it won't always be vetch for hay, but looking for those options in a system um, is, is certainly uh, an option. Here's a drier, um, a drier environment, uh, different soils, different options work. Um, which Birch of Cropping did a few years ago. So if you look here, this is um, a four-year crop rotation where we put different breaks at the start and then grew three wheat crops in a row. And this is the gross margin. Here's wheat, continuous wheat for grain on the clay soil. So anything above this uh, line has done better than continuous wheat for the, on the clay soil uh, and on the sandy soil. So you, know, you can see some options here like peas for hay um, or even grain, some of the brown manure options. There were several options in that experiment that over the four years turned out to be um, as profitable or more profitable than continuous cereals, largely because you get um, water savings in the year immediately after these options uh, and you get nitrogen um, benefits flowing through the whole four years. So that's all I wanted to say about, about nitrogen. Um, I'll just mention phosphorus briefly. I mean, I've, I've I'm trying to use, I tried to use nitrogen as the, I guess, the, um, an example of fertility decline. Obviously, any nutrient can run down in a system. 
all of these nutrients cost money, um, so it's important to, to be looking at the balance of these nutrients um, in all situations. Phosphorus is the other big cost to a lot of people. Um, we worried um, a few years back that we're going to run out of phosphorus or that peak phosphorus, that's, that's sort of abated a little, although you know, supply may still be an issue. Problems with phosphorus, um, the, the problems that are likely to perhaps um, really be constraining um, are things like the depletion of subsoil phosphorus, which is more of a problem in northern Australia rather than southern Australia. But you can still get stratification in, in long-term no-till systems where the phosphorus is um, concentrated at the surface, which, which may dry out. Um, the solutions um, uh, people are looking at include sort of novel products, deep, deep phosphorus placement, and also there's genetic solutions um, where um, some groups are looking at um, modifying root traits. In this case, this is wheat, uh, root hairs, and, and looking at root systems of wheat that's better able to get at some of the phosphorus that may otherwise be unavailable in soils. So there is technologies um, being investigated. Just to mention about soil acidity, um, another thing I guess if, if, uh, if you take the eye off this ball, I did, I, I, there would appear to be um, a lot of uh, affordable lime left in the system and so with, if you keep your eye on that and you manage the acidity it shouldn't be a big issue. Obviously um, you have to be careful of acidifying subsoils. If, if you put all the lime on the surface and it stays there, you can have subsoils acidifying. Here's an example from southern New South Wales. Um, where we have a strategic tillage project, just showing that in long-term no-till systems, um, you can get this acidification below the surface because um, lime's being left on the top, and on these soils it doesn't move very far. If I took a 0 to 10 centimetre and sent that off for analysis, they'd both tell me I, my pH is, is OK, um, whereas the seed here is going into some pretty nasty pHs um, compared to this one. So, just be mindful of, of whether you, this sort of issue is developing. Um, and of course there are, uh, particularly in Western Australia, some soils that just continue to be acid at depth and there um, I guess you have to take sort of more drastic, drastic uh, action. So um, now I want to move on to weeds. Um, uh, this is a, a slide James Hunt provided for me. Um, this, is, this is James's shadow here. Um, this is a paddock on his own farm. He just wanted to sort of make the point that this, this paddock was continuous cereal for 13 years. Um, it, was, it was perfectly profitable, it wasn't the best on the farm, it wasn't the worst, until ryegrass became group B resistant. And this has now had to be cut for hay for um, several years um, to deal with that, but it's often the first place the wheels fall off. Um, and so again, a lot of other people are going to be dealing with weed issues. I, I, I just want to say that again, um, utilising a diversity of crops, diversity of herbicides, diversity of practices is the only solution to keeping on top of, of herbicide resistance. Um, and there's been a lot of work done in, in this over uh, of different strategies. Um, and we've done some um, studies in southern New South Wales looking at this in areas where we have already developed a pretty nasty herbicide resistant ryegrass problem. Um, looking at the different diverse options you can get into the system and seeing if they can be in, integrated in a profitable way. Um, here's an example of some three year sequences. We started with uh, fairly high numbers of ryegrass. You can see here that um, if you don't use a break crop um, and if you use pretty low input sort of herbicides, low cost herbicides, you can end up with um, uh, still a big weed problem at the end of that, or spend a lot of money on herbicides and not make a lot of money. Um, but by introducing sort of single or double break options, um, there's a range of different options here over the, th over the three years, uh, which have driven herbicide resistant populations down at the same time as making um, reasonable profit. So again, the answer here may be different for different paddocks and circumstances, but, but find some options that, that work um, and be aware of the, of the costs and look at things over time. Uh, another study, a more recent study here, where we're comparing uh, what we call an aggressive system, high input um, uh, high crops here. These are the yields for the canola wheat wheat, just to sort of give you an idea of, of the yields we've been achieving. Um, a conservative system where we went with sort of cheaper herbicides, just trying to see if we could um, spend less money. Um, I think you can see what happened there. We, we certainly spent less money. We made reasonable profit, uh, pretty good 
at pretty good risk levels, but we ended up after four years with a worse herbicide-resistant ryegrass problem. Um, and both the aggressive option and the sustainable option, um, well, we were able to, with the same vetch incorporated, vetch canola wheat barley system, um, higher profit at lower risk and getting the herbicide resistant weeds down to a similar level. Weeds are going to be an ongoing challenge. There's two talks uh, later in this program dealing with the latest in weeds. It's just an ongoing problem, but, but um, uh, I guess if you, if you don't change, if you don't have a diverse system and practices, you're just going to generate a different weed problem. So it's, it, it's something that, that you have to continue to stay on top of. Again, pests and diseases like weeds, um, if you think about which ones can't be affordably managed with best bet management, probably these are some of the things we really need to be keeping our eye on, things that are developing resistance, things that are overcoming resistance, things that have a wide host range, um, exotic things. Uh, we need to be mindful and again um, a diverse system is going to help you best cope with, with things like that. An example is in the north where Pratolanchus thornii is a nematode that hosts on barley, chickpea and wheat and most of the summer crops they grow. So this was a pathogen that's been building up in the north and, and now they're really having to um, take a good look at their system on how to bring this under control. They've got a few options uh, fortunately. So just to sort of um, finish that section off, I guess with my own experience, I've been managing a long-term field site for 28 years now. These are the crops we've been growing, and I guess I was just reflecting on this to, to um, you know, it was a tillage trial, so I was trying to keep a pretty diverse rotation. Um, we've had a couple of periods where we've had to use green manures or fallows to get on top of some herbicide-resistant weeds. Um, the system certainly isn't broken. We're still growing pretty good crops after 28 years. Um, but the soil carbon there uh, has declined in the top 10 centimetres from 1.3 to 0.9. So even with my management, um, uh, I've been relying on, on getting a lot of nitrogen out of the, out of the soil there, um, and now it's going to be increasingly difficult to rely on that and more expensive to replace it. So just now um, to finish off on economic risks, the limitations with these experiments, of course, is that you can only look at a limited number of season and in small plots can you really deal with the sorts of things you guys face in paddocks with weeds. So we, we use modelling and simulation to try and deal with, them, with, the, with the seasonal aspects and we can certainly, um, with things like APSIM and LUSO and RIM, we can get some idea of what's going to happen over a longer period of time. In this case, it's, it's, it's a herbicide resistant weed problem in continuous wheat or a one year break or, or a brown manure every four years. But there are just certain things you can't you can't really do with experiments and where you really need to take a, a look at a farm business. Things like the level of labour, the debt, the equity, the sort of stuff that Ed has um, spent his, and his colleagues have spent his time looking at. And I think there's been some really interesting um, uh, papers on that recently. Um, this one's been shown, I know, a lot, just demonstrating that over the last several years we're just having to spend a hell of a lot more money to make the same level of profit, so we're exposed to a lot of risk. And, and analysing where those costs are coming from and how to stay on top of those costs, of course, is a really important aspect of remaining viable in a continuous cropping system. Uh, because often in a continuous cropping system, you're taking a lot more risk. And so getting that under control, I think, has been the message that has been coming out of these studies recently. Um, this was provided to me by Michael Moody and comes for, from some work that he and Ed have been doing, running a model, a, a full sort of business model over, over farms. And I just want to show the main messages from some of this, particularly in the lower rainfall areas. So this is for a typical farm in Karoonda um, and uh, shows that the, the, the um, outcome for business profit in very dry years through to very wet years, and sort of showing that the, the um, continuous cropping or high percentage cropping uh, does very well in the, in the, in the wet years, but um, less so in the dry years. So you can sort of see cropping's favoured here, mixed, mixed farming is favoured here. If you just look at an average season, I mean, one of the messages here was to, you've got to know um, what happens on your, on your, in your business when, you get those, when you're confronted with those different situations because just looking at the average would tell you they're all doing pretty well, they'll all do pretty well. You'll see that the 100% cereal has sort of not done very well throughout, reinforcing the message about diversity. Um, and I guess what these guys are, are sort of saying is we have to look for and strive for are systems 
um, that can capture the upside in these good years but minimise this risk in the down years. So we're, we're almost looking, um, if we are continuously cropping, we're looking for innovations and strategies that can kind of give us a shape and capture the best of both of those worlds. And that's a challenge, but that's, um, I think, a challenge for agronomists. And finally, um, looking at the kinds of businesses that are succeeding um, and a whole range of different studies where people looked at um, what, what drives success, there were some very, there were some commonalities between quite different studies. You can see things related to being on top of your technical side, good agronomy, um, being prepared operationally timely. Equally, knowing how to run a business and keep your eye on the risks and costs. And interestingly, all of them mentioned good people management. I mean, the skills to be able to manage this requires good people who are skilled up um, and can manage um, all, of these, uh, all of these things. Experience from the West, this is a study that, um, I mean, if ever there was a place that's intensified its cropping and in these years had some pretty nasty drought years, this is a study of how 123 farms in that area of northwest Western Australia fared over those years looking at business indicators and I guess um, you'll see a lot of very familiar messages there that are coming out of the work from, from, the, from the south as well. And maintaining enterprise diversity was, was a key. So I guess to finish off um, and to simplify the messages somewhat, um, I think with careful management and in the right circumstances, um, continuous cropping can be sustained. These are the key um, challenges, I think, that really are going to be the ones that bring that unstuck if they're not managed well. And the secret, I think, or, or what underpins all of this is having a suitably diverse crop or end-use portfolio and also being flexible with, with practices. And with that, I'd like to thank all of these people who, who contributed to, to the talk and uh, thank you for the invitation.